Hello, and welcome to Opera Insight 2024. I'm Dr. Don Feinberg, the presenter for your Opera Insight video series. This year, the series includes five segments, one for each of the five operas of Santa Fe Opera's 2024 festival season. As usual, Opera Insight views these operas with a psychological perspective. And as always, the emphasis will be on one main goal, increasing your enjoyment of each and every one of these productions. So let's get started. It's been said that the way you can tell the difference between an operatic tragedy and a comedy is whether it ends with someone getting married or buried. The reason you sometimes have to wait until the end is because along the way, in great opera, there are lighthearted moments in dramatic opera seria, and similarly, there are serious, even violent parts of comedic opera buffa, and this season is no different. There are tragic outcomes, like with Verdi's La Traviata, through which we understand love as a vehicle that can traverse social convention or be smothered by them. And another, at other times, true love prevails, as in Donizetti's The Elixir of Love, through which we experience the powerful magic of love to overcome obstacles and misunderstandings. Don Giovanni, where the finale includes the newlywed and the recently dead, as we engage the darker side of carnal love. And finally, our world premiere, The Righteous, mixes love with power, politics, and spiritual growth. This opera shows us love in a larger context of spirituality. Our opera, The Elixir of Love, inspired the theme for this season, The Recipe for Love. As Tracy K. Smith, the Pulitzer Prize winning librettist of The Righteous says in her book, to, Ca to Free the Captives, love is a sustaining force, a source of strength and resolve and inspiration. In Opera Insight 2024, we'll consider what each opera contributes to our understanding of love and to our deeply held feelings. And what a season it is. Four of the most popular operas, real fan favorites, and to top it all off, a world premiere. You know, in other seasons, people have told me that they enjoy these opera insight videos because it helps them to decide which productions to see that summer. Well, I'm afraid this year, I won't be much help. All the productions are fantastic, with the emphasis on fan. Whether you are new to loving opera or you have been a fan for decades, this season is for you. If you have ever wanted to get a subscription for all the operas, this is the year to get that season ticket. Opera after opera, you'll be betting on a winner. And with that said, let's jump into our opening night opera, Verdi's La Traviata. And with, as with all the operas this season, we'll look at how this opera contributes to our recipe for love. First, let's set the scene. Instead of the middle of the 19th century, which is contemporary France for Verdi, for us it is set in the past, Paris 1939, before Hitler's invasion and the Vichy government. For the French, it is the end of an era. This choice, though, is not arbitrary. That was the time in French society when it was in transition. This era parallels the transition of Violetta's societal role. She was a lorette, a woman who's in service to the men of high society, who in turn support her. Lorettes accompany men to social events, throw parties, provide beautiful eye candy on the arm of rich men who can pay for the privilege. It was a social role that was on the verge of extinction, just like that stratum of French society on the brink of World War II. In our production, the opera opens with Violetta, its central character, lying on her deathbed. What unfolds, we experience as scenes from her memory. As conceived by the director, Luisa Muller, the structure of the opera invites us to see Violetta in a very intimate way through her own eyes. Psychologically speaking, episodic memory is how our brains actually function. The scenes of the opera are like highlights of the flashbacks of events late in her life when she tried to abandon her life as a Lorette, to try a different life, a life informed by love. She introduces the first ingredient for a recipe of love. 
Loving relationships do not occur in a vacuum. They are embedded in a context. In this particular opera, that context includes physical well-being and social mores. From these vantage points, let's learn about love. Immediately after the overture, we find ourselves at one of Violetta's famous parties. We hear the famous drinking song. As hostess Violetta is everybody's favorite, but not really special to anyone. She lives in the demi-monde of the high society of Paris. At the party, we meet Alfredo and her current sponsor, Baron Dufal. He takes an immediate dislike to Alfredo, who's dedicated his verse of the toast to Violetta, and it's caught her eye. Now in the repartee, Violetta asserts she has never trusted love. She lives for pleasure alone, because she apparently knows what men are like. She states, love is fleeting and short-lived joy. And she tells the flirting Alfredo, speak not to love to one who knows what it is. Alfredo adores Violetta for apparently no good reason. And a little later, we find out he actually had a reason. A year ago, he explains, one day you passed before me, happy and light as air. And even since that day, even without knowing it, I loved you. Like I said, for no good reason. His idea of love is personal, projective, and overly idealized. But this is an opera, and he is a tenor. And when he sings his idea of love, well, we tend to forgive him because we forgive great tenors almost anything. And you'll judge for yourselves, the seductive power of his presentation. Now, this is a good time to introduce the idea of director's discretion. A libretto is the same in every production, but the director shapes how the singers express these words. Now, in this scene, Violetta's words rebuff Alfredo overtly, but observe whether or not her facial expression and body language tell a different story. Shortly thereafter, we understand how credible his seductive presentation really was, because she invites him back the very next day. At that point, he promises to love and to take care of her, and she sees it as like this. What a joy, such as I have never known, loving, being loved, and can I scorn it for the arid nonsense of my present life? Violetta embraces an option she thought she'd never have during her lifetime. And then, in another great moment of director's discretion, she hears him sing a reprise of his aria. Now, in some productions, it is clearly in her mind and memory and imagination. Well, in others, he's actually standing outside her window, sort of pressuring her. I personally prefer the former interpretation. Love is in her mind a dream that soon collides with the realities of the world, realities that create an inescapable, undermining set of contexts for her love. The first of these inescapable realities is her physical health. She suffers from consumption. This is the old time name for tuberculosis, a disease that weakens and wastes and literally consumes its sufferers. The disease is like a character in the opera. It competes with Alfredo for Violetta. We meet it in the first scene. Having just recovered from a bout of illness, she swoons at the party. After briefly checking her out, her friends continue to party until dawn. This gives Alfredo a chance to get her alone and to make his affections known. As the first act ends, Violetta thinks maybe this is it, real love. And for now, Alfredo triumphs over his deadly rival. Act two opens in a French country house where Violetta and Alfredo live. He is playing at being a painter, just as she is playing at a domestic life together. We find out that the love-struck Alfredo is particularly impressed that Violetta has given up everything of her luxuries in a past life to be with him alone. He remembers her saying, I want to live only for you. And he eats it up, not to mention He's been also eating her out of house and home. He had noticed that in the last three months, she bought the house and supported their lifestyle. He is oblivious to the fantasy world in which he lives. Remember I said, we forgive tenors almost anything? Well, apparently Violetta does as well. 
Next, Violetta's maid enters. She's on a mission. She's been sworn to secrecy, but she spills the beans to Alfredo. She's on the way to Paris to pawn more stuff. Yes, she tells him she is supporting you. He is taken aback, but he resolves to go to Paris to straighten things out. An invitation has arrived to a party in Paris. Violetta doesn't really intend to go, but what happens next is central to the tragedy. It is the second undermining context for this doomed love. Germain, Alfredo's father, arrives. He's a baritone, and sometimes it's not good news when the baritone arrives. First, he accuses her of basically being a call girl, living in sin, out of wedlock, and living off the family money. Violetta flashes some receipts, and he changes his tune and comes clean. There isn't that much family money, only their good name, and Alfredo's sister has, a, has an arranged marriage, but the husband-to-be will balk at the deal if her brother Alfredo continues to hang out with, well, her, from the demimond world of the Lorette. Here's the part of the narrative that never gets any attention, but I wonder about it. There's a parallel here. The sister is expected to find social status and help the family through marriage, you know, basically being paid to give up her body. And in that case, it clearly it's an arranged marriage. It has nothing to do with love because her husband-to-be would cancel the whole deal because of what? His future brother-in-law? But he would. So Germant begs her to do the right thing and save his daughter's engagement and the family by giving up Alfredo forever. Violetta acknowledges that this is something she must do, despite the fact that she also knows her illness is getting worse and she may not have much more time to live. In what many consider the most touching scene in the opera, Violetta asks Germant to embrace her as a daughter. He readily agrees and does so, realizing that she's an honorable person and not the gold digger as he had assumed. She knows she may not have long to live, and she agrees to sacrifice what's left of her life for her beloved and his family. Remember, the opera is called La Traviata, often translated as the fallen woman. Ironically, she is the character in the opera with the most integrity. When Alfredo returns, Violetta's letter arrives for him. It says she's leaving him forever. Alfredo finds his invitation to the party. At that point, he assumes correctly that she will now be there, and he storms off seeking revenge. He feels offended. He believes she chucked him out for being a deadbeat gigolo. At the party, Alfredo creates a scene. He confronts Violetta. He throws down a wad, a wad of cash he just won at the party. General chaos ensues. The Baron swears to avenge this insult. Germont witnesses Violetta's harsh treatment. He silently sees both how unfair his immature son is treating Violetta, and maybe he also sees how unfairly his social group has viewed the Lorettes. Simultaneously, Alfredo realizes how badly he's just blown it as the chorus intent on kicking him out confronts him. In the final act, Act 3, we rejoin Violetta on her deathbed. Alfredo's true rival, her consumption, is about to take her from him. And like the old theater adage, if you introduce a gun in the first act, somebody's going to get shot before the play ends, and this illness is just such a weapon. Although she ultimately succumbs to it, she recognizes that her time on earth, although limited, is understandable in the in relation to her sacrifice, because she chooses to help Germain's family, and that sacrifice is all the more meaningful. Alfredo has been told by his father about the noble sacrifice. He rushes to her side. He encourages her denial with a gorgeous duet about how they're going to set up another house outside of Paris. Now, in researching La Traviata, I came across an interesting fact. Although, as mentioned before, La Traviata is usually translated as the fallen woman, I learned that its Italian root is the verb traviare, meaning to mislead. 
and especially for Violetta, in relation to Alfredo, a better translation for this title might be The Misled Woman. What makes Violetta's story all the more tragic is that as she discovers her capacity for true love, her love is thwarted by two contexts, social constraints that stifle her spirit as surely as medical illness suffocates her body. Perhaps Maya Angelou said it best, I can be changed by what happens to me, but I refuse to be reduced by it. And indeed, Violetta was not. Next time, we meet another protagonist, unchanged in his view of love to the very end. Unfortunately, he's as villainous as Violetta is virtuous as we enter the lecherous world of this title character. See you next time, Opera Insight 2024 Segment 2, Mozart's Don Giovanni. See you then.